Sarah Reznikoff uh, from recently Virginia Tech. Uh, she'll talk about newest notes on regular ideals of CSER algebras. Take it away. Um, all right. That different? That better? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Thanks, Mike. And um, yeah, thanks to the organizers for inviting me and for organizing everything and so on. And yeah, we'll try to repeat questions. I may alter those questions as I <laughs> see fit. Um, yeah, I'm at Virginia Tech now. So these are uh, kind of revamped notes from some talks I've given on work um, that's joint with John Brown, Adam Fuller, and, and David Pitts. It's um, in revisions right now for publication. Actually, I'm not sure if it's on the archive, but you could try to find out or um, ask me where to find it. And that's all. I'm not sure what the title was either, but basically I'll be, I will be talking about regular ideals of C star algebras and what they can do for us. Okay, so, um, and yeah, thanks y'all for coming. It's not super early, but I know I did post the title and abstract a little bit late. So first uh, slide, we'll talk about Carton subalgebras. And we've already seen a bit of this from Elizabeth Gillespie, at least. And I'll mention her at least one other time. She's done a lot of work in this area. So I'll first repeat the definition. And this is a definition for C star algebras. Um, it was inspired by analogous uh, notion for Riemann algebras. Um, well, we won't go into that except at one point. Um, so if A is a C star algebra, a maximal abelian star subalgebra is a Cartan subalgebra if these conditions hold. So must have a faithful conditional expectation onto it. A set of normalizers of this subalgebra must generate the whole algebra and um, the subalgebra needs an approximate identity. Okay, so um, there's a definition. Now I'm just going to throw out a few things and there are many more about why we should care. I think most people know they, they should care if they, even if they, they don't about Cartan subalgebras. Um, so here's a big one that belongs in this room, but nothing to do with me. I'm not fit to, to go into details about it. Um, recently, there have been um, serious connections made with the classification program, um, between the classification program and the presence of Cartan subalgebras. And then uh, more closely related to the things I've done and things that, um, and very closely related to what Elizabeth talked about yesterday, um, Renault's kind of um, central theorem in the area is that the presence of a Cartan subalgebra is equivalent to having a particularly nice dynamical representation for a C star subalgebra, in particular one that is um, de described um, from a topologically principal etal groupoid twist. Oh, I haven't started using this yet here. Oh, wow, okay, that's kind of big. Um, <clears throat> all right, so there's Renault's theorem. And it's been, so it's great. It tells you, well, it does tell you if you already have a nice groupoid representation. Okay, cool. There's your uh, Cartan subalgebra. It tells you if you have a Cartan subalgebra, you have a groupoid representation. Obviously, I already said these are equivalent. It doesn't always give you a recipe for finding one. And so there still is a lot of work to do and has been a lot of work to do. Um, um, so here's a couple of a couple of things, um, and I, I put, added this slide only because Elizabeth mentioned it yesterday, and it's rele relevant to what she was doing. That um, with John Brown and actually, I guess these same authors, I defined a relatively Cartan inclusion, a gamma Cartan, relative to an action of a discrete group. Okay, and um, this—that's my paper six, but um, nine is uh, John and Elizabeth's paper which does a lot more with that idea. And then um, let's see, another thing I worked on, and in fact, um, not just Elizabeth, but another possibly audience member, at least a participant here, Anna, who is at least not wearing what she did yesterday. There she is. Okay. <laughs> um, on this, this tricky thing, suppose you have a non-topologically principal groupoid algebra. Well, it still may have a Cartan subalgebra. You just don't know exactly what that will look like. 
because it's not the, the you know, topologically principal one. So these are just some things that have been done. Um, I'm not gonna talk about them today. We are gonna talk about instead uh, regular ideals. So when will we find out about See? So our questions, this is a little bit historical. I don't know if it's the best way to inform what I'm going to talk about. You can look at our paper for another way. That feels a little odd as well, but our question a few years ago was um, based on this theorem for von Neumann algebras and von Neumann Carton subalgebras um, that gives um, a theory of inclusions that if you have a Carton subalgebra D in A and then an intermediate subalgebra, um, then you'll have another pair as well based on that intermediate one. And of course, we wanted to know, um, okay, maybe we, I guess we did this with this Excel, yeah. Um, we wanted to know, is the analog true for um, C star carton pairs? And the answer, I guess, unfortunately, but you know, it is, the answer turns out to be no, but it, it is, um, we get a yes in one special case, and that is in the case that um, that the uh, the uh, let's see the intermediate subalgebra is also um, described by from an open subgroupoid of the Lyell groupoid, and this was that um, you know salient representation by a topologically principal nice groupoid that Elizabeth told us about yesterday. I'm not going to go into the details today. Um, in that case, it's yes. But so we were we were asking that question, a little bit disappointed by the answer, but we need to move on. So in that same conversation, so this is supposed to motivate what I'm going to do. In the same conversation, we said, well, what about under quotients? Okay, and that's basically what I'm going to get at today. Um, our C star Carton inclusions preserved under quotients, and well. Why did we get any work out of this? Because the answer is no, of course. Um, and I'd say graph algebra counterexamples exist. Well, other counterexamples do too, but those are particularly simple and we can get our hands on those. And I will show you one um, a little later in this talk once we've had a few more definitions of things. Um, but we're trying to figure out what we can do with this. So, one property that is enjoyed by Carton pairs is this ideal intersection property. So, and that's been used for several other things too. The next slide will be about this ideal intersection property. So that's what we focus on. All right. So what is it? It's a property of inclusions. Well, you can guess what it is. Um, I'll state it here. The inclusion of C star algebras has the ideal intersection property. If ideals, and by the way, well, I'm always talking about two sided closed ideals here. If ideals in the larger algebra, non trivial ideals, um, intersect down to be non trivial in the, in the smaller algebra. Okay, so this property, even if not explicitly mentioned, shows up in a lot of different um, contexts for us. Um, for example, in the context of uniqueness theorems. So when you have a C star algebra generated or defined from um, a graph, a K graph, a groupoid, some object like that, um, when, is it, um, when is it isomorphic to the uh, like universal such one? It's just not that clear what I mean, unless you've seen this before, but what I mean is when, it, when is it there a unique um, non-degenerate representation of a graph or groupoid or whatever in C star algebra? So, okay, so it's rather obvious. You can state this, this answer in terms of uh, the ideal intersection property. If you had some subalgebra with this property, then of course you can, um, if you look at a representation on that subalgebra, you can, you can tell right away if, you can tell if, it's faithful on the larger algebra because the kernel will have um, not disappeared under quotients. All right. 
um, or not disappeared when you look at the subalgebra, sorry, the gauge invariant uniqueness theorem, um, or various ones of these, um, are using this ideal intersection property, um, state that if there's a gauge action on the algebra, then the fixed point algebra has this property. Okay, and then um, let's throw these all together actually. Um, and then this has been used by several, at least one other person who might be in the room, uh, Matthew Kennedy, um, Archibald Spielberg and Sierkowski, and uh, we'll put them together in the right groups according to the slide. Um, they have uh, used this to characterize when the action of discrete abelian group is topologically free. And some of this is actually very new too. Okay. So this has been an important property. What are we gonna do with it here? Um, well, the bad news is gonna be that this is also not preserved under quotients. Let's get there. Let's, um, or good news if you want more work to do, which I guess we did and we did it. Um, let's step back um, because I wanna use graph algebras for an example or counterexample or several things and just make sure we're clear on my notation and hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully that won't be offset by any <laughs> typos appearing. But um, so recall the definition of a graph algebra. I think this, this slide is gonna be almost like internal, like you'll really only need this notation for the slide itself, but let's just say it. Um, so a graph algebra is uh, an assignment of mutual, mutually orthogonal projections to the vertices in a graph, partial isometries to the edges, satisfying these Kunz-Krieger relations that um, relate the partial isometry of the source of an edge, well, equate the partial isometry of the source of an edge to the, um, sorry, the projection corresponding to a source of an edge should be the source projection of the partial isometry corresponding to the edge. And then over here, I won't try to say it, but you know, the range projections of edges coinciding at a certain um, range add up to that projection. Those are just usual things. They tell you my convention in case you need to know that. Um, again, sort of internal notation here, E star is a set of all the finite paths, including vertices, paths of length zero. And then we can extend the notation. And then we immediately shift to lowercase because uh, we have a universal system and that'll be rendered in lowercase, I think, if I use it. Um, okay. <laughs> well, how you can, how, how you can make it into a groupoid? Well, I'm just or? wondering if that's sort of helped. You can, uh, there is a path groupoid associated to it but um, those morphisms are not, they're not edges, they're infinite paths, okay. right? Um, with a range and no source. So this, so this is, uh, yeah, then, <clears throat> yeah, for the, the path groupoid that I just described. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not gonna, I don't think I'm gonna, <clears throat> as much as I do talk about groupoids, I'm not gonna talk about that one in, in particular, although I should, maybe I should. Um, Maybe I should. Yeah, I will at some point. <laughs> I'll say something. <laughs> yeah, at the right time. Um, maybe this is the right time. I'm not sure. Yeah, it probably is. Okay, so the this diagonal subalgebra, which is it corresponds to the where it's defined by. Sorry. Even this was too early, I guess. Uh, so was generated by the projections corresponding to the finite paths. All right. Um, that diagonal subalgebra will have the ideal intersection property in the case that E has no cycles without entry, all right? And actually it's if and only if that comes later, although I, I feel like I already knew it, so. And in this case also, by the way, this diagonal, so in this case also um, that path groupoid that, that George just made me talk about is going to be nice in all the senses that we need to write topologically principal and atoll and so on. And then um, 
we're going to have a Cartan subalgebra that's really explicit right from the path group void representation. But anyway, okay, so there's your first time I mentioned condition L. And um, since we talk about the gauge action a uh, number of times, you may as well see it here that this is just the standard gauge action that just measures the length of a path, basically, right? So if the length is zero, it doesn't do anything, doesn't do anything to a projection. If the length is length is greater, it multiplies it by the correct number. Okay, so what are quotient graphs? Okay, well, the punchline here is gonna be that the quotient of a graph algebra by an ideal is <clears throat> the graph algebra of another graph, which we we'll call it quotient graph, even though the notation, it's a little strange, it's really a subgraph, okay? But we, for this matching, <clears throat> we call it a quotient graph. So what do we do? We start with an ideal, look at all of the uh, vertices whose projections got, um, are in the ideal, toss them out, right? This is the kind of quotienting idea, toss them out, and then toss out all the edges connected to them. And even though here I'm only talking about um, edges whose sources are in that tossed out set, it's actually gonna be the ones whose ranges are as well, just by um, the configure relations and the fact that it's an ideal. So don't worry about that. And it's a subgraph, so <clears throat> yeah, range and source maps. <clears throat> are inherited and here from a while ago um, result that actually, yes, this is the C star algebra we're talking about as long as, sorry, as long as it's a gauge invariant ideal, okay? Gauge invariant ideals are those who are generated by their vertices. And I'm not proving this theorem of Bates, Pass, Gray, Vernon, and Zemanski, but it's clear, it's pretty believable enough that we want to restrict to ideals that are generated by their vertices if we're doing things in this um, vertex-centered way. <laughs> okay, so as I said, nice things don't pass to quotients just um, all the time. So here's an example. Um, this graph satisfies L. So um, every uh, cycle has an entry, right? So um, the, and this was a Kunz-Krieger uniqueness theorem. I'm not proving it, I just quoted. So the diagonal has this ideal intersection property, but it's easy to find an ideal um, whose quotient will give you a subalgebra that doesn't. So the ideal generated by just U and V is gonna get rid of U and V. Uh, when you quotient, you're gonna get rid of U and V. You're obviously gonna get rid of that edge to W. You're gonna only have a, cycle without entry, right? That doesn't satisfy L. And at this point, I need to say moreover doesn't satisfy the IIP. Those are equivalent. Okay, so, so this isn't gonna be, this isn't gonna be any better than just looking at Carton unless we do something new. So <clears throat> one thing to do that doesn't help us, but I'll just say condition K was identified by um, Comgen and others as something that can pass to quotients. So we can look at ideals, understand ideals through this. So here's again, an older theorem that um, if the graph satisfies K, um, then yeah, we still have K. So I didn't write down precisely, but you know, a little exercise if you haven't seen it before, which one implies the other K and L, they're not equivalent but we're more interested in L. In fact, I'm, I'm kind of interested in not even having L, but at least I'm more interested in the condition as a question. So somewhat repeating what I said before, graphs can, <clears throat> can satisfy L, satisfy the conditions of the uh, Kunz krieger uniqueness theorem, the one that just says um, all we care about is the diagonal. Uh, have a Carton diagonal subalgebra. I mentioned that before, and that goes along with the path algebra being, um, uh, sorry, the path group void being nice in all these senses, topologically principal, I call and so on. <clears throat> yeah, there, I said that too. Okay, but L doesn't pass to quotients. So what can we do? Um, <clears throat> instead of imposing more conditions or different conditions on the graph, um, 
we imposed a new condition on the ideals that we're willing to quotient by. Okay, and that condition is called regularity. And with this condition, which I'll define, I believe, on the next slide, we do have um, quotients inheriting L. <clears throat> this paper also includes, I wonder if I have another bullet point. Yeah, okay. Two, two more things. One is um, uh, this fact that regular ideals turn out to be gauge invariant. That's just a corollary of our result. And um, this paper, by the way, yes. Yeah, so this paper is published in the Rocky Mountain Journal. It's very short though. Um, and also includes a concrete description of the vertex set corresponding to regular ideals, which I may actually mutter to you at one point when we're looking at a picture. It's, um, it is concrete. It, it kind of just unravels the definition using the Kronzkrieger relations <laughs> and what an ideal does. Okay, so this was our first stab at it when we said, let's just restrict our attention to graphs and see what we can do. Um, but I didn't define regular ideals, so now I better back up and do that here. So, um, well, if we take a bunch of elements in C star algebra, we can define the um, X, we'll define X part, the annihilator of it, and we call an ideal regular if it is its own double annihilator. All right. So this is related to one other meaning of regularity, and that is the regularity of an open set in a topological space. Um, <clears throat> you'll see that on the rest of the slide. So an open set's regular if it's its own, it, if it's the interior of its own closure. And um, if you define perp correctly, then you can make it look exactly the same as the definition we just gave. So um, here's one relationship between uh, regular open sets besides this possibly uh, just artificial uh, coincidence of notation, right? One relationship is that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between regular ideals in a C-star algebra and the regular open sets in a um, primitive ideal space. So here's that. I, I don't know. I just threw this proof on here. But um, to convince you that it's a reasonable definition, well, if I, you know, I'll go back. There we go. <clears throat> yeah, so there already was, you may already know, the one to one correspondence between the ideals and the open sets. And then it just turns out to, it just restricts perfectly to um, the regular ideals and the regular open sets. Okay, so it's nothing really new here. Here's an example, um, I think, yeah, I didn't change it, but this is, this is the, the, the David Pitts um, version, <laughs> statement of this example. Um, it's not too difficult to see, but if uh, X is compact, then um, an ideal in C of X is regular, compact in Hausdorff, so we have, you know, C star algebra in C of X is regular if and only if, um, this set here is the closure of its interior, so probably you want to look at a complement and get you know, something being the interior of its closure to fit with what we're talking about. Okay, so that's more <clears throat> an example of an ideal that is regular. All right, so what are we going to do with these? Well, I told you already the good news for graph algebras. We're going to do more with that, but first, um, Hopefully to not cause confusion, there's another definition of regularity. Um, and this is for inclusions. Um, and this is a more general definition than Carton. Yeah. Oh, let's see. Do you want me to go back here? Yeah. So, which? Yeah. 
Yeah, well, that well that, that should be, you know, hopefully the complement of what we're talking about. You'll need to unravel that, yeah. Because, yeah, this this literally is the closure of the, yeah, it's not a, it's not a mistake. It's just, I don't know why I, I took this. <clears throat> I uh, saw David Pitts wrote this down. I said, yeah, does this make sense? Or, uh, you know, and said, yeah, and slapped that down instead of making it look a little more, uh, a little more in the direction we want to look at it, but yeah. Yeah, thanks for asking. So, um, regular inclusions. I you know maybe this word's used over too much. Uh, too much this regular word, but uh, there is a meaning of a regular inclusion. And what is it? It's something um, trying to be Cartan, but possibly not quite. So, regular inclusion contains an approximate unit and um, has a set of normalizers that generates the the whole algebra. It needn't be Cartan. But I mean, Cartan implies regular, not the other way, right? So just to be clear, because um, I think I didn't include this on slides the last time I talked about it, um, these, what invariance means in these contexts. Um, so if we have a conditional expectation from A to B, then invariance means um, it's invariant under normalizers in this sense. And more relevant to today here, so an ideal is invariant in, in you know, the analogous sense here, if the conditional expectation, um, oh, sorry, wait, hang on. No, 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 this doesn't make sense exactly. It looks like, um, okay, we need this ideal to be invariant, and this is not what it means. It should be invariant under, I mean, it shouldn't have to do with the conditional expectation in this, so here, like, there's a little exercise to fill in what an ideal being invariant ought to mean. Okay, so um, let's see, what is our first theorem moving towards what we really want? So where are we in this, um, in these slides? So we already stated that in the graph algebra case, if you um, quotient by a regular ideal, uh, you preserve L, okay? We're trying to look beyond just graphs, and so um, what can we do? We're trying to look at what happens when you start with a Cartan pair and quotient, right? We know you can't just quotient by um, any ideal and expect to get a Cartan pair. That's false. We'll see an easy example later, but we already know you can kill L, so you should be able you're gonna kill that diagonal Cartan pair anyway. Um, so this is a step in this direction, starting with a regular inclusion. What can we do? It might not be Cartan. Um, if we have, uh, okay, here's something I didn't state here. Um, we have a regular inclusion with a faithful invariant conditional expectation. So a Cartan would be an example of this. And then we have, um, something called the regular IIP. Okay, now what's that? That means the ideal intersection property, but only for regular ideals. So regular ideals um, are not killed. Okay, uh, when you go down to the subalgebra, then the invariant regular ideals form a complete Boolean algebra. Let's look a bit farther. Um, we're gonna need this later. Um, this notation, if we if we get to the slide, I think it's at the very end, so I'll put it here, um, that there's a Boolean algebra isomorphism between the regular ideals of the larger algebra and the invariant regular ideals of the subalgebra, and this is the map it's given by. Um, obviously, well, obviously, hopefully, you know, we were just going to be intersecting down to go from the larger one to the smaller one. That's fine. How do we go up? Um, turns out to be this, and we'll see a little more about it later. Turns out to be the set of elements in the larger algebra um, that we'll expect down to the ideal and the smaller one. That little iota, I sort of regret. It's for it's for uh, people who are making sure that. We're really looking at the inclusion as needed. So this is this is just an inclusion map. All right, so we'll we'll revisit this last step 
a little bit later. Let's do something more interesting now. So what happens to the ideal intersection property under regular quotients? Good things. Um, we're not ready to talk about them yet because I was just going to throw down here uh, an anal a somewhat analogous related and possibly stronger result of Excel from this year. So this is, I think it's, it's on the archive unless he's taken it down for some reason. Um, that gives you another, um, it, it replaces some of our hypothesis with a mild axiom he calls IND or N, and you'll need to look that up. I just wanted to put it out here that um, he's also done something there. Okay, now on the topic of this slide though, uh, what's our result? So we start with a regular inclusion that has the ideal intersection property and then um, an invariant faithful conditional expectation. So let's go back for a sec. Oh, let me just go way back. We didn't need that for a regular inclusion. So we're kind of just building back up to saying, yeah, we should be talking about Carton subalgebras, but we did it in full generality. So here we are. So we have a conditional expectation. We have the other aspects of Carton basically a regular inclusion and then um, a regular ideal. Now, when we, um, when we uh, quotient, we do get the ideal intersection property preserved. So here's really what we were looking for, which is um, what if it's Carton? So this theorem is, is um, I will give you a little bit about the proof here. Um, this theorem is basically just a restatement of the, the previous theorem with a little more uh, beef to it because we're at the Carton level. So um, if you look at a regular ideal quotient by the I, you do preserve this Carton pair. So I don't wanna go into the whole proof here, but um, the regularity part is not terribly hard. Um, you just do kind of the obvious thing. Um, just make sure that you get the approximate unit that you think you're going to have from quotient and um, normalizers also, that's fairly straightforward. Um, the other part to get um, the conditional expectation, it also works pretty well, but you do need to use the ideal intersection property that Carton, the Carton algebra, subalgebra had in the first place to get this to work. All right. So I like to include this just because it's kind of fun to look at. Um, so this, I should say a converse is false. There are several ways to make a converse from uh, an interesting statement sometimes. And the converse I'm talking about here is um, this if, so, okay, sorry to go back. Uh, what did it say? If we quotient by a regular ideal, then we still have a Carton subalgebra. The converse that I'm refuting here is that if we quotient by an ideal and get a Carton subalgebra, then the ideal had to be regular. This is just sort of a fun thing to do. So let's do it. And we can do this with a graph as well. So here's a graph. Um, notice there's a, a V naught and a V zero. And this does like bother me a little bit because I have a little bit of a set theory background, but those are different. They're different symbols, I guess. They're just being used as symbols. Yeah, those, those uh, subscripts are symbols without meaning. Okay. All right. Oh, I don't know why that was cut off. But anyway, mm, I don't think we're going to need to know to uh, see that to know what it's saying. So what are we doing here? We're going to, um, okay, so another thing you know if you've looked at these at all is that um, saturated hereditary sets will generate, of vertices will generate an ideal whose vertices are exactly those vertices and no others, okay? So what is this set of vertices we're starting with? Um, I didn't define this, but I'll tell you that it's the tree of V0, meaning everything that's at or below V0 here. So all of this stuff 
all the vertices below be zero or above it if the, you're going the other way on the arrows, all right? Along with everything that's below any one that goes this way and then turns left at some point. So everything down here is gone or in H anyway, gonna be gone. Everything, there's another edge coming out down here. All those are gone, all those are gone. Everything, okay, we got rid of all of everything except this graph, which you can't really see, but it is just these loops with the edges connecting them. That's it. That's all that's left when we quotient. So um, <clears throat> the original graph had L. Every cycle has an entry. They're not all drawn. They're the <coughs> dots. You're supposed to guess that this continues on this binary way. Every cycle had an entry. That's still the case here because we do have, so it, we do have all of this, all right? So we still have the Cartan subalgebra um, generated by the diagonal, well, that is the diagonal, but the ideal was not regular. How do I know that the ideal was not regular? So the ideal is the one, okay, wait, where is this thing? The ideal is the one generated by these vertices. I will just tell you the kind of technical statement of this concrete statement I mentioned that how to tell if an ideal is regular. The ideal is not regular because there are vertices, let's say V1, for example, that appear that are not in the ideal, they appear in the quotient. It's one of those, okay? But wherever I go down, I can turn again and be in that um, ideal, okay? So it's like if any ancestor of an ancestor is in the ideal, you ought to be in the ideal too, but that fails here. And so, I'm not writing it down, but that's the concrete description in terms of the graph of what regularity means. And it sort of makes sense that it should have it sound a little bit like that because regularity was like the perp of a perp, the annihilator of annihilator. And here I'm saying ancestors of ancestors. So, you know, you can write it down. It, it does make sense. All right. So that was just for fun. Um, we have... Uh, few things left, what were we doing there? So that was our, um, oops, sorry. That was our, um, probably the main result of this new paper, that if you have a Cartan subalgebra, quotient by a regular ideal, you still get that Cartan subalgebra. Just because you have one in a quotient doesn't mean your ideal was regular, if that matters, okay? There you go. And now here are a few bonus theorems that you get for my lack of including a lot of detail about the previous ones. Um, and these connect also to the graph algebra case. So, uh, okay, so I don't properly uh, reference that. This is the, the newer paper, which hopefully come on the next few years, we're in revisions. Um, so if we start with, uh, there we go. A regular inclusion, for example, a Cartan inclusion. And um, well, like if, there's a, if, if it's Cartan, then of course the smaller algebra will be abelian. And I should have mentioned that's one of the, I should have probably called attention to the fact that's one of the big ticket things missing from regularity is that um, the subalgebra being abelian, let alone maximal abelian, it's not required. And assume that the relative commutant of that smaller of the subalgebra is, is abelian though, okay? And then if uh, actually that one gives you a Cartan inclusion, and I'll be giving you an example in just a second that's probably familiar to many of you, then um, the original inclusion has the ideal intersection property, if and only if the larger one has the regular ideal intersection property. The regular ideal intersection property, again, is the same thing, but where we only look at regular ideals. So if we only care about regular ideals for, um, okay, 
Um, yeah, if we only care about regular ideals, we've actually learned the whole story in this case. So here's a corollary to bring it back to something we can put our hands on. So if you have a graph that does not satisfy L, okay, so again, what would that mean for a lot of these notions? That would mean that the, um, if it does not satisfy L, then the diagonal subalgebra will be regular in it, but it won't be, um, Abelian, uh, sorry, it won't be, it will not be Carton. Of course, it will be Abelian. It will not be Carton, but its um, relative commutant will be. Okay, that's the so called uh, cyclene subalgebra. So if you don't have L, then that diagonal subalgebra is not maximal Abelian. But if you blow up blow up the diagonal subalgebra to include things that capture those cycles without entry, basically, then that will be maximal abelian. In fact, it will be Carton. So that'll be your, and it will be the relative commutant as well. It will satisfy this. Um, what am I saying here? There's no way that that diagonal subalgebra could have the rel a regular ideal intersection property. And why is that? That's because, uh, well, we know it doesn't have the ideal intersection property. Okay. Some of these were like um, some corollaries, as you know, are observations you make to explain why previous uh, proof methods didn't work. And I think this was one of those. <laughs> All right. So here's another kind of bonus theorem. Um, suppose we have a groupoid twist and like I didn't define those. I think um, Elizabeth gave enough of a definition. So um, you probably have an idea from yesterday. So you have a groupoid twist and a regular open set closed under. So what does this mean? Um, if you have, and these are um, units. So if you have a source of a morphism in this groupoid, then you better have its range as well. Okay, now we can take the subgroupoid. Um, yeah, okay, so then we're gonna take the subgroupoid, um, basically defined from this set of vertices U. All right, and that, then we get a regular ideal um, generated by that. But if this tells us what all the regular ideals of a C star algebra of a twisted groupoid are. In this case, let me give you the, um, the uh, well, it's, here we go, um, the corollary, which is again, a little more tangible. If a graph satisfies L, then any regular ideal is gauge invariant. Okay, so let me unravel this a little bit more. So, um, Okay, what's this theorem telling you? If you have the ideal intersection property in this, so what, what is this? This you might recognize from yesterday. This could be the, um, uh, this could be the, the vial groupoid, for instance, and it's um, Carton subalgebra here. So in that case, we would have the ideal intersection property. And this is telling us here that every regular ideal is of the form, is generated by an open set of vertices, basically. All right. And then, um, okay, but not, not exactly generated as long as you take a double perp. And then in the case where G is uh, exact, you don't, need to, you don't need to bother with that. And so a corollary here is, so uh, let's go here. If a graph satisfies L, okay, in which case the, um, in which case what? A lot of stuff that's not all on here, but the path groupoid has all the nice properties, so it is a vial groupoid, okay? You don't need a twist at all for this. And um, then you're going to see that, what, what do we find out? That every regular ideal is of uh, this form. We look down here, okay? 
Um, and that means in particular that it's gonna be generated by its vertices and its gauge invariant. Okay, there's kind of a lot to unpack here, but if you're familiar with all the different details, it's fairly straightforward corollary to it. Okay, so it tells what the regular ideals of a graph algebra set of satisfying L are, and you could extend that to other um, more generally as well, because we do know, um, well, it would be a little more work. I would like to do that to extend it more generally to the case where um, this isn't your uh, vial pair, this isn't your vial groupoid, but you do know what it should be because it's the cyclin subalgebra. All right, I've got one or two more slides here. Uh, maybe this is the last slide actually. So I told you we were gonna go back and look at that this um, correspondence between uh, the regular ideals of the larger algebra and the small algebra, okay? So um, one thing we saw above, I won't go find it, but trust me, we saw above that if you have a Carton pair and you have an invariant regular ideal, then, okay, so then we have, um, there we go. Then how do you uh, find, so let's see, this is a regular invariant ideal of the smaller algebra, the subalgebra. What does it correspond to in that one-to-one -one correspondence? It corresponds to this ideal that I call JK, right? And I think on that slide, I also told you how to go the other way. Well, the other way is just taking the intersection, okay? So um, this JK, this ideal in the larger algebra, intersected down to the smaller algebra is gonna give you K, the regular ideal you started with. And that's the same as the uh, conditional expectation onto it. On the other hand, um, this kind of equation is also satisfied by the ideal generated in A by K. So this, again, this is an observation meant that explained to us what went wrong with the original guess of ours, which was like, oh, the, the correspondence between these regular ideals ought to be uh, K in the little algebra. It's just generated to give you a bigger ideal on the big algebra, and then you intersect down, right? But that didn't turn out to be exactly right. Um, in graph algebras, it is right that you get the same, these are exactly the same ideal, but in the general setting, it's actually not true. And um, I, I don't know if we have a counterexample in our paper, but um, you could concoct one by what I'm about to say that, um, oops, oh, sorry, I didn't say anything. Okay, I didn't give any more detail, but that in the case where A is nuclear, in fact, I don't even think you need the full strength of that. Um, yeah, I don't think you need the full strength of that, but certainly it's true. When A is nuclear, you need some kind of exactness anyway. Um, and K is an invariant regular ideal, then you do, get, you do get the exact same thing from these two processes, from looking at the expectation and looking at generating K in the big one. All right, so I think that's it for the, the math. Uh, final comments here. So the graph algebra material has been adapted to the K-graph situation by uh, Tim Schenkel. That's at least on the archive. And um, even though David Pitts is not here, I always have to say like he really insisted that we um, do as much as we could with pseudo expectations rather than assuming we have a conditional expectation. And some of that is in the paper as well. And then that's it. Thank you very much for coming this morning.